Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tech Field Day. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and we are here at Networking Field Day Exclusive with Nokia. We just had a great day of presentations and some lab work with our friends at Nokia showing off some of their new event-driven automation platform goodness. And what we wanted to do was, now that we have taken an opportunity to kind of discuss it, kick the tires, and understand kind of how it works, we're going to open this up to our delegates to do a little bit of a roundtable discussion. These are some of our most popular events during field day, where we let our delegates have a turn to do some of the talking, to kind of give their thoughts on things, but also maybe get a little pushback from some of our presenters. We're joined by Bruce and Mike, who were here earlier today, and they are going to uh, offer some sage-like opinions as well. So I'd like to open this up to our great delegates by kind of talking a little bit about some of the things behind automation. And I actually did an interview with Mike uh, a little bit ago that I think kind of informs on this a little bit. We've been talking about automation for years, decades even, and it seems like a lot of companies get started in automation by, uh, by doing some easy things, right? Uh, we'll we'll, we'll re make this task a little bit more repeatable. I'll set this thing up so that it fires off once a week and sends me a, a notification or a report or something like that. And then those are good wins. And then the next thing you know, your automation initiative has stalled. Suddenly, nobody cares about it anymore because, oh, it's, it's too simple. Or, wow, that, that's something we'd really like to automate, but man, that is way too complex for us to really take on right now without causing a lot of problems. And then it's six months from now and nobody seems to care until the next platform comes in and promises to automate everything and make it so much easier. And then there's a little bit of a frenzy. It's kind of like spring cleaning in your house, right? There's a reason why they call it that is because you really only get motivated to do it like once a year. So I'm gonna open this up to my, my uh, practitioners here. What are we dealing with here? Why is it that automation seems to fall apart even though we get those successes? Seems that there's a conference series dedicated to this. Uh, okay, <laughs> yes. In fairness, let's plug Scott's uh, so conference. You know, uh, the uh, Network Automation Forum, Autocon, uh, has been tackling some of these uh, questions quite a bit. And yeah, I might have put you on the spot a little bit here. It's okay. But like, what is it that you guys are seeing at Autocon? Why are, why are so many people coming to this thing if automation is something we should have already been doing anyway? I, I think it's great evidence that people want help. Like the people who show up at the AutoCon events are folks that they self-select. Mm -hmm. They want to learn. They want to see, okay, what are other people doing? Um, there's a long laundry list of why it's not moving along faster than we think. Um, we don't really think about automation from a network design perspective. We don't build it to be automatable. Um, there's some, you can check the blog posts on networkautomation.forum. There's a lot of that that's already been covered. Um, I think one of the things that we haven't touched on is the lack of thinking about workflow and like processes and how different tasks chain together um, and how automation tools can actually change how you develop processes. So I'm going to stop you right there, Scott, because I know I've read through all of those best practice documents and that's a great idea in theory, but my special unique snowflake isn't that much different and you should be able to automate that for me right even though like nothing matches up with any of those documentations and all that and i can't even tell you exactly how we built it but you should be able to figure that out for me right <laughs> um I, are you in, interested in entering in a consulting relationship is that what you're saying tom <laughs> it, but isn't that how kind of how it works is like we've talked about this for years i can remember when the very first systems were being virtualized and it's like oh well, I would love for you to be able to virtualize this server that has a very special hardware loadout and has this hardware dongle that has to be plugged into it in order to work. That's not hard, right? Because virtualization is easy. Well, I would say, let, let's scope it to the context of the data center, which is why we're here today. Mm -hmm. um, data center architectures are largely stabilizing, right? Everybody's kind of figured out that we have topper X switches, leafs, and we have spine switches. And they're assembled in a clove fabric we have a couple variations on a theme of what services will run on them, what what underlay we'll use, and then what overlay services. But those are pretty big modules that, because of the sameness of data center architecture, it's a great place to focus on, all right, how do we super automate what's happening in the data center today? Agree? Disagree? Different thoughts? The core network architectures are fine, but it's more... So, you know, every vendor comes along, they're like, here's our data center architecture, it's your standard five-stage fabric, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Then you start actually going to implement, you go, okay, where do my firewalls plug in? 
how exactly should I do my DCI? How should I, you know, it's like within that fabric, it's all fine. It's sort of like, yeah, whatever, stand it. As soon as you start plugging into the outside world, yep. things start to get a little bit funny. And that's probably where you start seeing a lot more of the variation come in. Sure. And you don't have to, like, so DCI and firewall placement, those are maybe the other two biggest items. You know, and you've, you've scoped them in, um, but it's still pretty stable within, within that scope. Right, and your firewall filters and your rules according to your organization's policies, that's obviously gonna be custom, so. Maybe stability is part of the problem. Um, you know, we've been building data center networks for many years and there's some enterprise data centers that once the fabric is in place, once the guts of the system are in place, there's, in my experience, there hasn't been a whole lot of changes after there's been, um, downlinks, southbound interfaces and stuff like that, you know, change a VLAN or do this or that, whatever, but there hasn't been a ton of uh, changes there. Um, so it, it's been difficult to get, um, you know, to market or to sell management and the people with the wallets to decide that we want to spend the money on automating something and, and adding consistency to something that a manager doesn't care if there's slight differences in interfaces, interface configs, if the data center network isn't going down as a whole. I want to let Andy jump in because I think he had something, but hold your thoughts about that management piece because we'll come back to that. Well, I was just going to take the role of Tom Hollinsworth and respectfully disagree that <laughs> everything is standardized and CLO and, and not snowflakes. Um, and that's just based on my experience, but I worked at two Fortune 100 companies with global networks. Tons of snowflakes, not running spine leaf. Um, and we had talked about this before. A lot of that one off was driven by, you know, BU fire drills of like, oh, we have sure. this application, we got it. Yeah, yeah. And we go around all of our standards. So, it, it, you know, and even like IP addresses, like everything's just discontinuous. I mean, it's so if everything was a standard spine leaf and everything's close and everything, like that's great, but they're not the environments I've worked in. And then on top of that, you have the people. Um, most, a lot of network engineers that I know that I've worked with, you know, we got into networking because we didn't like development, we didn't like coding, we didn't sure. like CICD pipelines, we didn't like it, we like, you know, Python. I, I know that there's a split in networking, there, there are those who do and those who do not. Yep. I mean, I failed out of computer science, I didn't, I wanted nothing to do with it. Now here we are all these years later, we have to automate, you know, automate or, or be a dinosaur, so that's, between the the architectures that aren't standardized, which I think there's a lot of, and a lot of uh, technical debt sitting in those places. And sure. then culturally, the people, like, okay, guys, we're gonna automate, and where are we gonna start, and when are we gonna learn? And if we do Ansible, because it's easy, well, every time they upgrade Ansible, they break all the playbooks that you spent all that time building anyway. So like, it, I don't know, it seems like a hard problem to solve. You know, so, you know, this, this dialogue that, you know, we keep having and others keep having, yeah. might be really good to get some data like on, you know, where is Greenfield Network design going for data centers? Let's, let's try and find a way to put some numbers behind that beyond just our, you know, our experience, which is by definition limited. And I will interject here by saying, for those of you out there that are wondering, the plural of anecdote is not data. But we get that a lot. Oh, this one time, this one thing happened. Right. You have to actually collect statistics and you have to be honest with yourself. How long did this take? How long or how many things did this affect? Um, if you're trying to paint a rosy picture for the management team of, no, we, we really didn't crash the whole thing for 20 minutes last week. It was more like five. Uh, you're doing yourself a disservice because, well, just like some of the conversations that we had uh, in the in the sessions, um, most people don't understand exactly how long it takes to do something as simple as a software upgrade, because like Bruce mentioned, it's staging it, it's testing it, and then it's rolling it out on to a series of devices, making sure that they come back up, and then if they don't, you need to back it off, and then that takes hours upon hours of time to collect all that data to be sure that everything works. And then of course, as soon as we go to sleep, it all gets undone by magical elves, mm -hmm. and then we have to go back in and roll all the changes back anyway, at least that's what I used to have to do. So without hard data, without real practitioners coming in and saying, it saved X time, or we spent more time doing this because everybody knows the story of the person who got into automation and spent three days automating a two minute task because I'm gonna prove that I can do this. Right. 
I, I think disagree. There's being... I was going to say, I just one slide. I disagree about the anecdotes and not data thing. If you've been burned by ISSU once really badly, that's all the data I need. Do not trust that. Route. We have our data on that. <laughs> Ron? Well, on the other hand, I believe progress is being made. I think uh, that what we're seeing, and this came out in our conversations today, is that we're getting more of that data, more of that evidence. For example, through network automation, you can uh, decrease operational uh, overhead by up to 40%. I think that is an encouraging stat that's originated from Bell Labs. So this has, I think, validity, ecosystem um, standing. Also, I think uh, people are getting more use cases, like, okay, automation worked in this environment, therefore I can reduce my fear of the unknown, and we've seen automation in our everyday lives make a difference. Like everybody goes to an automated telemachine, don't think twice about getting cash automatically. But time stamping myself, I remember the first time I used an ATM, I was nervous that it wasn't going to work right. Like it was you know, like going into a bank and getting the teller to give you the cash directly. And I think this is going to be this through experience. Like the more uh, decision makers have knowledge of how to use chat GPT in their everyday lives, they're like, oh, why can't I just do this for a data center? architecture design and other uh, you know, uh, related uh, applications. So I think uh, what we're seeing is that we're kind of at the threshold now of having uh, breakthroughs uh, that are going to be ecosystem wide in terms of automation being implemented on a more widespread basis within data center environments at least. I think while that stat 40% uh, increase with automation from Bell Labs, I think that's a great stat, but the truth is most of the companies that I work with and their enterprise customers do not have anyone who knows automation on staff. And occasionally when I ask that question, they'll say, oh, he left. So they don't have anybody. So I think that's a big fear is for companies, if they get someone trained up on automation or they hire someone who knows automation and can realize those gains in performance by using automation, I think there's a fear well, how long is it going to take to ramp somebody up? We're busy trying to keep the lights on. We're busy trying to keep the data center from going down. So I don't see it as we're on the cusp of this major change uh, because we've been kind of at that edge for so long. And then if you look at any of the big vendors, Nokia included in data center, what option did you give us? A UI, which is automating. And then all the other controller-based systems out there are automating, but it's through a UI. It's a journey. I'm just seeing progress. I think things like Gen AI can be an assist. Mm -hmm. It can make you know, natural language familiarity and using these uh, systems more democratized. So it reduces the need for specialization, you know, people with expertise to be able to oversee uh, automa automation implementations. And it could be, you know, on a certainly organization-wide level, the CXOs are really backing it. We've seen cutovers like that. But I think it's more uh, incremental. Like, okay, here's one part of the organization that is implemented automation successfully. This can be emulated in other parts of the organization. I just think uh, the technology is just becoming more distributed and enabling these capabilities that automation will just become more a uh, part of the fabric of the, not just the data centers, but in enterprise networks and other networks uh, throughout uh, the networking world. Sure. <laughs> well, you look like you wanted to say something, so I'm going to let you jump in here. Um, so I, I think there's, a, I guess, a, a couple of things. Um, one, I, I think when we equate automation to effort, I think you get one outcome, and it's like, I do a thing, I'm going to automate my thing, the impact is naturally bounded. When you equate automation to time, you get a different, um, it's just a whole different outcome. And I'll, I'll give you like an example. I'll obscure the names to protect the innocent. Um, I was talking to a large uh, retailer with a big e-retail um, presence uh, in Europe, and I asked them how long it takes them to turn up a new server. And I thought the answer would be, you know, minutes. And it takes them like six to eight weeks. And so I had to ask the question, I'm like, so you, know, you, you all run a cloud, how can it take six to eight weeks? And the answer was, well, we have uh, draconian change controls. They were like an ITIL shop. So they had to stage the changes for a governance meeting. 
by the, the governance meetings met at like every every four to six weeks. So depending on when the change was initiated, you had to wait till that meeting. Yeah. There was a change window two weeks after that meeting. The change window failed 80% of the time. And so there was a backup change window another two weeks later. And so the elapsed time was, you know, let's say six to eight weeks when the actual effort was actually relatively small. And so the problem, if you're trying to solve the effort problem, the solution looks like one thing. If you're solving the, the elapsed time where time accumulates, it's a different thing. Um, so I think that's instructive because I don't think, I think people are oriented around effort for the most part. And I actually think you should be oriented around time, which in, in time, by the way, is going to transact around data and how do you move information around. The, the second piece, and I, I, um, I, so Rita, I think you're right when you talk about like what's the, you know, we've, we've been on the cusp forever, like what's the catalyst to push us over the edge, right? And that's the basic question. Um, you know, I, there might be a technical catalyst. Uh, um, I think I see a few now and again, but I actually think that the bigger, the looming catalyst, there's going to be a wholesale turnover in the workforce over the next, you know, 10 years. Um, and we can debate for companies whether that's going to hit you in a year or three years or five years, whenever. But when network engineers age out and they retire, the, the bumper crop of folks that follow are unlikely to come out of university with networking degrees and with four and five letter certifications. So when they move over, if you require a crazy certification and rote memorization of vendor specific syntax to be effective in an environment, you're not going to be able to hire. And so you'll have the most expensive networking team ever. They'll be average age 75. And and you'll be losing this is your retirement plan. Yeah. Actually, this is part of like funding my retirement. Is yeah, Unix twenty thirty eight bug is going to be like my Y two K, you know, in my career thing. That and then a little bit of consulting through into my mid seventies. I mean, this is it's the same. Good, I'm like it's all part of the plan. Keep going, tell me more. <laughs> so so if if the looming workforce transition though, like that's good, that will force people to make decisions, um, if only because they have to hire, right? I mean, at, at some point. So when that happens, I think there's a, a, a different set of tools. They're more likely to be familiar with AWS and Azure, right? You know, maybe things like Terraform or Kubernetes or whatever are more familiar. Um, and so I think at that point, I, I do think you see a change. Um, now, I don't know that having talked to a lot of folks, I'm not sure how many have deliberate plans around that. So it could be that there's a the, the, the enlightened will have a plan. The others will be victims and it'll happen to them and then they'll, they'll scramble for the, you know, four or five years to figure it out. But I think either way, you'll see things will start to move. Um, you know, I think individuals can decide whether that's a painful move or whether it's a sort of a, a graceful leap. So something else that I picked up on in this last little bit that I think is important to address is the skills gap when it comes to automation. Because you said the companies have implemented automation and then when you ask them, oh, well, that person's gone. So nobody knows how to work on it. I'm gonna tell a story very quickly about a friend of mine that I used to work with named Wayne Bolin. Wayne, if you're watching, hi. Um, he, back in the early aughts, built one of the most amazing things that I'd ever seen. It was, in a, it was Novell's Dear XML, later known as Identity Manager, where when a student was provisioned in the enrollment system of his school, like 15 different IDs got automatically created from that. And it was beautiful. And he left because he was tired of working at a school and he could make more money elsewhere. And then he had to get contracted back to the school to keep working on the system so that it didn't break. And then he actually went on to be like a countrywide Dear XML guru because of that, because he made it work in ways that people hadn't expected. But that was a very small, very specific piece, much like I'm, I'm guessing with some of the people that you were talking to, that's a great idea in theory, but if I have to do handcrafted artisanal um, automation to make this work, then I can't ever be fired. I can never be promoted. I can basically, to Mike's point, ask for whatever amount of money that I want. Whereas, coming back to what you said about Ansible, yeah, when they release a new version of Ansible, they break all the playbooks. Do they modify certain interactions in the playbook so that like 90% of it is still the same? Or do they change all of the language in the playbooks to Sanskrit and make you have to learn them all over again in order for it to work? I would bet it's not the latter. So by getting repeatable, stable, consistent skill sets in automation and building on those, kind of like Kubernetes, which is what we talked about earlier in those videos, does it make it more consumable because 
while I may not know Kubernetes as a networking engineer, there might be a few resources out there on the internet for me to learn. Shout out to Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way. But more importantly, when I leave, get promoted, whatever, somebody can come in behind me and not have to think like me to figure it out. Maybe they need to do that extra 5% that I did some custom work on. But if they're using a platform like EDA that is built on standards, that is built on reproducibility, that's easy to do. Because one of the things that we run into a hard time getting automation projects started is describing how our workflows work. I'll give you an example. In a movie that I love so dearly, Sneakers. When Whistler has to drive a car for the first time. Okay, put it in drive and go. Cool. What does that mean? Let's drive. Yeah. And then you see Robert Redford go three down. Because how do you tell somebody to put a car in drive when they can't see? You have to describe how a transmission works quickly, right? Can you describe some of your hairiest automation workflows so that it can be reproducible by someone like Mike who doesn't touch this stuff every day? I know. It's COVID. What a what a what a side eye. But so so do is is there value in taking this automation journey and making it more reproducible with standards now as opposed to 15 years ago when <laughs> we might as well write it in assembly language because that's about as understandable as it's going to be for anybody who's not me. Well, do you really mean standards or do you mean products? I know you said standards. Plug your ears, kids. Um, no, I mean something that someone can look at and figure out and derive from. I mean, because let's be fair, um, ATA over Ethernet is a standard. Right. Ain't nobody going to build an array out of ATA over Ethernet because that product died. Right. But likewise, I mean, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, I can pick any one of those three and still have support for it. If you build your automation in Object Rex, I will beat you. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> Two people at IBM still are. That's about it. I, I'm going to throw this, I'm going to compare it to um, a couple things that we talked about at a local network user group meeting a few weeks ago, Virginia Nug, where we had a roundtable discussion for about an hour on making networking in general more accessible to anybody coming into the workforce, new college grads, non-traditional routes, ex-military, and so forth. And two really good examples came up of corporate institutional training programs beyond a college degree. Um, one was the Sprint ASE program in the 90s, where you took a new grad and you put them through 12 more weeks of, here's what's going on with networking. Uh, Duan Lightfoot, an AWS guy, was also there, and I forget the name of his company at the time, but he had a very similar experience but not just networking technologies, other, other IT technologies bundled in there. And I think for companies that see value in getting a skill set out there, whether it's automation or anything else in the IT domains we're talking about, it's going to take effort. It's not just going to happen. We haven't been getting it out of the universities for decades now, right? We still take people with a basis, you know, in understanding and then put them through additional training. That seems to be something that's slipping in corporate America today. A biased, biased view, but maybe we need a little revival of that and put the chips on, whether it's network automation or cloud technologies or other pieces of the puzzle. We don't need to include frame relay in X.25 anymore, right? So we can swap other things in. Seems like part of the part of the solution. I when you said it seems like that's slipping, I actually uh very familiar with several associate programs, ASE being one that multiple yep. companies have right. and spend, you know, six months, up to six months yeah. training. This goes really well now them. for that. Let's put it on the table. Sure. Yes. Yep. Yes. And actually two of my children have gone through yep. an associate program like that. Yep. So um, I'm glad to see that they're out there and uh, they're very successful and they create very loyal employees. Yep. They create loyal employees. Mm -hmm. To whom? So if, so let's say, let's just throw Cisco out there. The Cisco employees that go through their CSAP, their ASC program, they 
tend to stick around a lot longer than some other employees. Where? The company that At invested in The company in that them. invested in them. Hmm. That's odd. I have 7,000 people that would disagree with you today. Well, that's a whole different story. Why? Uh, because they, it's a shift. The company didn't stick around with them. It's, but it's a shift. It's a shift in the technology and making sure that they're skating where the puck is going. So as they're losing 7,000, they haven't stopped hiring new. It's just different skill sets. So they're not training those people they have. And who's responsible for making sure those people get trained? Oh, it's been pushed on to the individual now. And that's the thing like you talk about. We pushed on them by who? Ultimately, it's that maybe that's what should happen, but it's not going to happen. Lindsay. It's going to be on the individual. Pushed on them by whom? Ultimately, it's a shareholder thing, I think. But yeah, but shareholders don't talk to employees. They do indirectly. Through whom? The shareholders if they have influence over the board who decides where investments should go and that ultimately is filters down to what employees perceive. Through the management layer. And here is one of the things that I think has become a bigger impediment to implementation of automation solutions is unrealistic expectations from a layer that is encapsulated and abstracted away from reality. All right, you're following this on LinkedIn, don't hate me. Most managers are bad. They are probably good, yeah, Mike's like staring at me again. <laughs> Most managers in a technical capacity are bad because they're either people who are good at management and have no idea what their people are doing, or they're people who are really good at what they were doing and we didn't have anything else for them to do, so we made them a manager so that we could give them a little bit more money. And unless you have literally taken management classes or read any one of the wonderful book recommendations that Mike Bashong has given out on podcasts, you are probably really bad at dealing with people. So one of two things happens. Either you get caught off guard when your people bring you a project and say, we want to try this. Well, now I'm not effectively managing people, so I have to cover for myself. Or you have recommendations from the C-suite, from the shareholders, from the market pushing down on you saying, we must do X, where X is automation, AI, software-defined networking, ATM lane, you name it. And yet what happens is, is that that is poorly communicated and poorly implemented because management is really good at tracking statistics. Are my people doing what they're supposed to do in the amount of time that they say they're going to do it or that I believe they should do it? And is the company still making money from it? And if the answer to all of those things is no, what happens? The project is considered a failure. The people who are responsible for doing the project are usually either put on report or relieved from their duties. And we're right back where we started. And as someone mentioned on LinkedIn literally today, when's the last time you saw a manager get fired for letting all their employees go because they weren't doing their jobs? Very rarely are they fired for it. They're sometimes allowed to leave gracefully, but I think, and I will open this up for debate, I think that management is becoming the biggest impediment to making this happen because they are lost and they don't know how to make it happen. They can be flipped. I think uh, what we've seen in terms of you know, how do you sell automation into an organization, increasingly, my conversations, the CXOs are becoming more involved with that. It could be the marketing side, it can be uh, certainly the CISO side and, and so forth. And uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, to the point, yes, the barriers exist. It's sort of like, you know, what we saw with automobiles, lots of stick shift manual transmissions out there for many years, but now virtually everything is an automated, uh, automatic transmission. And I think that's where we're headed toward on the networking side as well. They look at social media applications, that's all intent based. It's all automated. When I go on to, you know, X Twitter or LinkedIn, all that information is automatically, you know, transmitted and it's handled securely and so forth. Why not the underlying network? Why can't it emulate what's, you know, what the apps and the workloads that are running over it doing already? And I think we're just getting closer to that for the very things that we talked about today. So I think it's about the time frame. If you take a snapshot of, you know, within the last five years, there's been some progress, but it's been slow going. 
But I anticipate over the next five years, to Mike's point, you know, with the shift in the workforce, with the, you know, natural language uh, prompting becoming more commonplace and so forth, that I think will, you know, convince more management that like, let's get on this network automation bandwagon where it makes the most sense. Are those the same managers that are having trouble getting I mean, we're going to have a mind uh, shift. Shank. So are those new management people going to be trained in these things that they need to be aware of, or are they going to come from the well, ranks? I think, the way yeah, they'll, they'll learn it. Like they're, they're using chat GPT every day. They're like, okay, if I'm using this to you know, shorten coding, to you know, make more efficient uh, documentation, why can I apply this to network design? Why can't I apply this to network architecture? So I think it's, it's a combination. Uh, it will be new blood and people who are like realizing, okay, uh, this is something that we can take a better advantage of. So I have I have management thoughts. Um, <laughs> so um, I take cloud as a, a both a success story and a cautionary tale. The people who move to cloud because they wanted to get better operations. I mean that's what you're purchasing as Amazon's investment in operations. They moved and had um, outcomes that were aligned with their expectations. They move faster. They're more quick to adopt things, whatever. People who viewed cloud as a means of shedding cost, they lifted and shifted and they found out that it cost a bunch of money to get there and then it was nominally the same ongoing expense. And so they had um, mixed to negative results and, and because their, their reasons for making the change were not good. Sure. Um, if people view operations primarily as reducing effort, cutting cost, uh, what they're going to find is that your cost goes up in the short term because you have to do all the things you're currently doing and then you have to automate. So they, they float your expense and they'll find that they don't they don't hit their, their TCO targets or whatever. And we should be clear, like when you hear TCO, it usually means that people have to lose jobs because you have to, at some point, the expense has to be real. Yep. Um, on the other side, folks who are, um, who view automation as a means of um, either uh, addressing the opportunity cost. I want my people to spend times on spend their time on higher value activities. They'll get a better return because they'll be able to participate in technologies that are more difference making. And I would suggest to you that there's two ways, there's, there's um, two things that are likely to, to, to separate these. One is uh, I think companies that are that are flat to down on it, like on a on a sustained trajectory, I think they're going to struggle to pick up new techniques because it's one, they're not going to invest in the talent required to, to cultivate the new techniques. And two, they're going to have a hard time trading things off because they're already running as lean as they can. You don't ever, no one has ever cut their way back into relevance. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, yeah. the second is the shops where IT is an enabler will be, for them, the funding models are usually like corporate tax. Um, they're going to work one way. Shops where IT is part of the supply chain, it's part of the service that they add, then they view it as part of the product and so they're more willing to invest in it because any savings or productivity gains that they get are um, look like uh, margin improvement at a, at a corporate level. So if a company is growing and or IT is part of the supply chain, I think they go after automation and they'll be successful. If a company is stagnant um, and or IT is merely an enabler. I think what you'll see is they will, they'll fail to attract the talent. Um, they'll stay roughly where they are and you'll continue to see, you know, one off um, swings and misses as an individual comes in and does something. But I don't think you'll see transformative change in those, in those environments. No one cuts their way back into relevancy. I feel like it was probably a little bit but I agree with you. And, and the thing that I think is probably most common is, is a company like that. Right? We don't think it's just the people who are just the fact. It's wildly different expectations of the outcome. Right? You know, their operations is just better off by a lot. It folded in the same way by itself. And it goes back to what we were talking about today from the other one. What is that? How does this improve that? You have to measure, right? You have to have data. You have to be able to say objectively with respect to, you know, every iPhone is 15% faster than last year. Is it really 15% faster? That's a quantitative, that's a qualitative analysis. Quantitative is faster. 
my cubicle and do very little, right? But quantitatively, if it was half as expensive, that's a really easy sell, right? Except it hardly ever is because those resources have to be invested some other way. And I think that that's one of the geniuses behind EDA is that you're making an investment in a platform that can produce results and help you track those metrics and show to people that you are saving time or improving network fragility or any one of a number of measurements that would help so that when the stakeholders come back to you and go, why did we invest all of this money in a thing? You can go, because of this. Well, and the, the, one of the hidden benefits, um, I, I, something we've done, I think, quite explicitly, but we don't talk about, there's got to be a bridge from where you are to where you want to be. And so if people, if you meet them where they are, it's about ease of consumption. The front, front end UI will dominate their experience. And if you look at where they want to be, like maybe API is the primary mode of consumption. How do you bridge that? That looks like two separate products. I think what we're doing here is we're, we're trying to, to thread the needle a bit and do a little bit of both. And whether we're successful, right? That'll, we'll have to wait and see. But building out something that is both easier to do and plugs into some, to a, a more cloud-like consumption model, like that's non-obvious. And a lot of the product efforts have done one or the other, right? They've, they focus on typically the power users, by the way. And then you ignore people where they are today. And then what you find is that your adoption is low. If you were to look at um, automation tools in our industry, adoption is a crazy low across all the tools. It tends to be fractured. And if you never build up a, a, like a strong community, then you don't have a lot of community best practices. There's not a lot of places to learn. And so then in our industry, if you're, oh, you're doing automation, like oh, what kind of Ansible are you using? <laughs> right? Because they're the only ones to get kind of escape velocity and right. that stuff. And even there, it's like, you know, there's real questions about, you know, whether that's sustainable long, long term. Well, it's because they got drag kicking and screaming by Red Hat through everything. Whatever the tool set is, right? The, that bridge, it, it takes work and learning new tooling and new tech. Like there's really no way around that. And like one of the concrete takeaways from me today was the, you know, the bristling of lots of Kubernetes heavy discussion and kind of realizing that, you know, with the skills gap that we have and more, more new and career people coming from a comp sci background, maybe that is a good choice. And maybe people like me need to suck it up and take, Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way, you know, and become more, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not really maybe thinking this, I know that I need to. Um, and I think that I'm representative of a class of trad net edge folks that, you know, if you want a path forward and you want that consulting career to last longer than you think, you know, tooling up and skilling up on new stuff is really smart. So maybe the thing with them, um, you know, often a lot of organizations is very few network engineers, even, my organization is not a good example. It's, you know, we did away with management, so we don't have that problem. <laughs> Actually, it is a pretty good example. Um, I think that's more common than you might think. We have a lot fewer network engineers than people would think. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of organizations out there. There's one or two network people. You know, you're kind of on your own. You know, who do you learn from? Who do you talk to? If you adopt some aspects of Kubernetes, Kubernetes in there, then maybe there's a chance that you've got some other people in your organization who you can talk to about some of these things. You're not, yeah. you're not on your own anymore. So I, 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 I said, wasn't sure about it at the start of the day. I'm still talking, I wasn't sure about that, but I've, I'm coming around to it. I'm coming around to it. It's that, but, but also positioned as a, it's there, because, you know, if you're going to deploy some new platform, yeah, sure, that's the way to go, yeah, whatever. But trying to push that down to the network model, but being there, but not, I can sort of can choose how much of that I want to consume. I, I quite like that message. So that was good. Well, as you can tell, there's a lot of strong opinions about